Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Prinsi Kumar, and it is my distinct privilege and pleasure on behalf of Dr. Luxon and the Department of Medicine, as well as my own Division of Infectious Diseases, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Adrian Scholler. Dr. Scholler received her medical degree from the University of Ottawa and did her residency and fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of Toronto. She also has a Master's of Science degree in clinical epidemiology from the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Gorgas Diploma course in clinical tropical medicine. Her specific area of interest and expertise is in tropical medicine and she serves as a section chief of tropical medicine and travel medicine in our division. Also, because of her unique expertise, she received the rare honor of being invited by the NIH this year to be an attending physician in the laboratory of parasitic disease and to lead NIH's clinical research in Chagas disease. A skilled and a brilliant clinician with tremendous work ethics, she takes the greatest pleasure in any worm or parasite, whether it's in the patient's poop, in their lungs, in their brain, or in their eyes. Her lectures usually revolve around what's hot in the tropics, but today Dr. Scholler wants to raise in our consciousness to think outside the tropics and to think about neglected disease in the United States. With this, I want to turn over to my partner and colleague, Dr. Shola. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. I could not have asked for a better introduction. Um, so today, um, as, as Dr. Kumar mentioned, our topic is think outside the tropics. So we're gonna be talking about global health at home. Just make sure my slides are advancing. Oh, uh, sorry, hold on a second. There we go. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, I have two disclosures. Um, the first is that we will discuss the off-label use of a couple of different antiparasitic drugs. And the second is that, um, as Dr. Tup Kumar alluded to, I apologize to anyone who is currently eating lunch. Um, I will warn you before I display anything that is overly graphic. So uh, before we talk about anything else, um, I wanna talk a bit about what is a neglected tropical disease. Um, these are groups of parasites, viruses, and bacteria that generally prevail in tropical and subtropical conditions. Um, but the most important feature of them is that they disproportionately affect people that are living in poverty, um, and they actually perpetuate poverty by causing chronic disease. Um, and they tend to occur in poverty because they occur when there are situations of inadequate sanitation, poor housing conditions, um, often that are in close contact with animal or, um, or insect vectors. And the way that they perpetuate poverty is they cause chronic disease like um, that impact uh, productivity and wage earning and that affect uh, maternal child health that in impair productivity and ability to generate an income. Globally, one out of every six people has a neglected tropical disease, and you can see from the distribution that it mainly affects tropical and subtropical nations. And looking at the global burden of diseases study, um, the top three worldwide are all soil transmitted helmets, meaning that you get them either by um, ingesting contaminated soil or through direct contact with contaminated soil. So the top three being Ascaris, Trichuris, and Hookworm which are all gastrointestinal parasites. And then you'll see quite a number of things on this list, but in total, the main neglected tropical diseases account for about 26 million lost disability adjusted life years. Again, reflecting that they tend to cause chronic disease rather than death. Uh, now I wanna introduce the concept of blue marble health, um, which is the idea that has been recently um, better understood that there is actually a paradoxical neglected tropical disease burden among the poor who are living in wealthy countries. And we now know that about half of the world's neglected tropical diseases occur among the 20 richest countries on the globe. You'll notice here in blue at the bottom that a major portion of the Southern part of the United States lights up. Okay, so we were just back to the concept of blue marble health, namely that um, there is a paradoxical neglected tropical disease burden among um, the poor living in wealthy countries. 
And um, this was actually very recently nicely shown in a study that was done in one of the poorest counties of, um, in Alabama, where they took stool samples and did qPCR for intestinal parasites, which is a very sensitive test. Um, as part of the surveys, they found that about 40% of people had exposed to raw sewage in their homes. And then um, par in parallel, uh, a third of the population had hookworm, 7% had strongyloides, and 5% had toxocara, which are levels that we would expect more in um, low-income uh, areas of the tropics. So this is very much a disease of rural poverty in the United States. Um, also keeping in mind uh, that uh, the United States, and in particular the DC metro area, is highly diverse. Um, the DC metro area that includes parts of Virginia and Maryland um, includes about 6 million people. And when I moved here, I actually did not realize that about 1.5 million people are foreign born, um, which is about 25% of the population. So this is a, a very, very diverse area. And um, looking at the regions that people uh, were born in, there's also a pretty even distribution between um, Asia, Latin America, and a significant proportion of the population that uh, was born in Africa. So it's, it's both diverse and distributed from around the world. Um, looking at country of origin, the top source countries, we have a very large uh, population that was originally from El Salvador. Um, other main countries, India, China, um, Ethiopia. So it's a, this is an area where if you're practicing, we need to know a bit about global health and infections that are chronic that can come from those places. So our objective today, um, first off, to get an appreciation for the burden of neglected tropical diseases in the United States. Um, we think of them as being zebras, but they are actually not rare. Um, I'm gonna spend some time talking about two neglected diseases that are of specific importance um, in the DC area based on our local epidemiology. Um, and at the end, we'll just talk about how to take a good travel history and do a little bit of a potpourri from my tropical medicine clinic. Um, but what I'm really hoping to convince everyone of, at the end is that it's very important for us to know where our patients were born, um, where they've lived, and where they've traveled. So part one, um, where were you born? You've heard my bio. Some, some people will pick it up from my accent. Um, but so this, this first case is one that came to Georgetown um, about three years ago. It was a 26-year-old man that for some reason had an EKG with his primary care doctor, we don't know why, um, and which showed some abnormalities. And usually I grill the residents, but for, the, for Zoom purposes, this is a right bundle branch block with a left interior fascicular block. And he also had some PACs and PVCs. Um, this prompted an echocardiogram that was initially read as normal. Um, but because of the very significant EKG abnormalities, he went on to receive a cardiac MRI. Thank you to the cardiologist and radiologist who helped me interpret this. Um, what you're seeing here is that there are there's trabeculations and fibrosis along one wall. And in particular, take a look at that apex. It's not contracting well. So there's a little bit of apical dyskinesis associated with some scarring. Um, this echo was initially read as probable left ventricular non-compaction. And unfortunately, this patient did not uh, continue to follow up with his cardiologist. So we fast forward to two years later um, when the same patient presented to hospital with acute sided, uh, right sided weakness and aphasia and was found to have a very large left MCA stroke. Um, his echo was repeated and this is subtle, but again here if you look at the apex, even though it was initially read as normal two years previously, you can see that there's a little bit of contrast here that's sitting longer than it should, um, reflecting some mild dyskinesis. And it was thought that he had a cardioembolic stroke um, related to a left ventricular thrombus. Um, he received the usual workup for stroke in a young person, including hypercoagulability workup, HIV testing, and syphilis serology that was negative. That's our first patient. Case number two is a 58-year-old man who presented with three years of atypical chest pain and had a normal cardiac workup, but then developed um, insidious progressive dysphagia, initially for solids, then progressing to liquids, to the point that he required TPN. And then he started developing problems with aspiration pneumonias. Um, he received manometry that showed evidence of type 2 achalasia, and uh, there's a very obvious abnormality on the barium swallow, so he has a very significantly dilated esophagus, and with, you can see, significant tapering at the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, both of these patients actually have the same disease, and the key to the diagnosis um, was knowing where the patient was originally born, um, and actually the first diagnosis was made by an echocardiographer um, and the second in gastroenterology clinic. Um, our first patient with um, cardiac issues as, as a young man um, was from rural El Salvador, and our second patient was from rural Bolivia. 
Um, both of them likely grew up in housing such as this. Um, so what you see here is um, adobe mud walls. Sometimes they can be also made of unfinished brick um, and thatched roofing and, roofing. and this provides the ideal habitat for this insect, which is otherwise known as the triatomine insect or the reduvid bug um, and is the vector of Chagas disease. So Chagas disease is otherwise known as American trypanosomiasis, um, otherwise known as trypanosoma cruzi. Um, this is what the protozoan parasite looks like um, when you see it on a blood smear. The overwhelming transmission is vector-borne from the insect that I showed you, the reduvid bug or the triatomine bug. Um, it's actually not the bug bite that transmits the infection. Um, what happens is the bug bites you and then it defecates adjacent to the bite site or in a mucous membrane and the protozoan parasite is present in bug feces. So then you, um, it typically bites at night, it's painless, but then when it, uh, it bites or um, defecates near a mucous membrane, people self-inoculate by scratching. Um, the other ways you can get it there, it can be transmitted from mother to child in utero. Um, it can be transmitted through blood transfusion. And prior to the um, mid 2000s, we were not screening the blood supply routinely. Um, organ transplantation is another mechanism that is very important to Georgetown University. And um, there are some reports of uh, outbreaks related to ingestion of fruit juices, usually acai or sugar cane, that are contaminated with um, ground out bug feces. Um, this is an infection where the overwhelming majority of people that have it live in rural Central and South America and Mexico. Um, but increasingly over the past decades, people have migrated to urban centers. And then um, also in parallel to that, uh, in the Latin American diaspora uh, of people that have migrated to Europe and North America, um, there is a significant prevalence. And in the United States, we think based on blood banking surveys and also some seroprevalence studies that we likely have about 300,000 cases of imported Chagas disease in the United States, which is a lot more than, than one might think. Um, and there have been some specific zero surveys that have looked at this in major urban centers. So one study in LA County found that if you were originally from Latin America, there was about a 1.25% prevalence of Chagas. This went up to 3%, 3.5% if you were born in El Salvador. Um, we also happen to have some data from the Washington DC area that is recent and not yet published that found a three to 4% prevalence if you were born in El Salvador. Um, and keeping in mind that we have one of the largest Salvadoran populations in the country. Um, and similarly, if, you're, if you were born in Guatemala or Nicaragua, a similar prevalence. Um, this was actually 20% in this study if you were born in Bolivia. Um, that seems to be very high and there was likely an element of selection bias. This was a convenient sample. However, it happens that the Bolivian born population around DC um, is preferentially from certain areas that, um, that actually have a lot of Chagas disease um, in Bolivia. And um, as I said, it's, it's particularly relevant because the DC area has a very diverse Latin American population. So there are about a million people in the DC metro area that self-identify as being um, from Latin America. Um, half of those people are foreign born. We have the second largest Salvadoran population in the United States um, and actually the largest Bolivian population um, in, the, in the United States, if you believe the Bolivian consulate. I will also briefly mention that even though this is an endemic disease in Mexico, Central and South America, in the United States, we do have both the insect vector and the parasite, but we very, very rarely see local transmission. Um, you can see this map of the United States. This is where, so triatomine insects exist all throughout the United States. We have 11 different species. Um, and they're actually very well documented trypanosoma cruzi infections in wildlife um, from a very, very broad range of species from armadillos to opossums. Um, it's actually a major problem in Texas and dogs, um, but there are very, very few human transmissions. And um, we think the reason for that is from, our, from a variety of factors. Um, one, one factor is just that we interact with our environment and have different housing conditions than what one might see in rural Central and South America. Um, the, sec the second aspect is that um, the biting patterns of the triatomy bugs are a little bit different here. So they tend to eat and then take a little bit longer before they defecate. So it may take a lot more contact with insects in order to have transmissions. Um, this may change uh, with, uh, with climate change. Um, so there are both acute and chronic phases of Chagas. I'll briefly mention the acute phase, but we almost never see this in the United States because there are very few local transmissions and it, this is not really a disease of travelers. Um, the presentation of acute Chagas is usually mild and nonspecific. So people have fever and malaise that is not otherwise diagnosed. Um, the one pathognomonic sign that I think people learn for the USMLEs 
as you can see this eyelid swelling. Um, this is known as Romagna sign and it's basically a local eyelid swelling related to inoculation with the parasite and it's sort of like a localized allergic reaction. Um, but you see that in the overwhelming minority of cases. Um, the one other way that we do see acute Chagas is through congenital transmission, and this is important because it's curable if it's recognized. Uh, we think we have about 40,000 reproductive aged women in the United States who have Chagas disease. Um, the transmission is about 3%, so which leads to about somewhere between 60 to 300 congenital transmissions every year, most of which are not recognized. Um, the reason they're not recognized, we don't think to screen the parents. Um, most children with this are asymptomatic at birth. They may develop complications later. Um, low birth weight and prematurity has a very broad diagnosis. And um, within the past few years, I'm, I'm aware of one case that presented to Children's National where the child was quite sick with multi-organ dysfunction. Um, and they did, um, the, the mother was originally from Bolivia. They did end up identifying it and treating the baby who ultimately did well. Um, and the, uh, the key here really is that this is preventable if the mother is treated before conception. So after the acute phase, which lasts um, typically for somewhere between one to three months, patients then present into, uh, progress into chronic Chagas, which initially um, in most patients begins as the indeterminate form, meaning that the patient is asymptomatic, has a normal EKG, and doesn't have any cardiac or GI manifestations. Over the course of decades, somewhere between 20 to 30 percent, so between two to five percent people per year, um, will then develop, go on to develop either cardiac or gastrointestinal manifestations, um, but overwhelmingly cardiac disease. And Chagas cardiomyopathy affects 1.2 million people globally. Um, in most patients, it takes decades to develop, so patients usually present in their 30s and 40s. Um, and in areas where this is endemic, it is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death um, for patients that have um, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, what you see here is a, um, this is a T. cruzi amastigote, so the tissue form that is present in a cardiac myocyte. And we think the mechanism of cardiac damage has to do with the combination of parasite persistence in tissue and also the immune-mediated effect of chronic inflammation that leading to fibrosis. And Chagas cardiomyopathy, one of the very classic signs, um, patients tend to develop these um, apical dyskinesis and apical aneurysms that you can see here on the pathology. Um, there is early, so early Chagas cardiac disease usually begins with um, a variety of different arrhythmias, but um, typically right bundle branch and left anterior fascicular block. So that's a very, very common manifestation. And then we'll sometimes see segmental left ventricular wall motion abnormalities as we did in this patient. Um, later on, it progresses to a wide variety of malignant arrhythmias, um, in particular left ventricular, uh, left ventricular apical aneurysms, um, often associated with thrombus formation. So a presenting symptom is stroke, and then also progressive dilated cardiomyopathy. And um, as I mentioned, these, these patients are at high risk um, of sudden cardiac death as well as progressive CHF. Um, this is something that is still poorly delineated, but from some studies, it appears that patients with Chagas disease progress more quickly and have a worse prognosis compared with other patients that have um, similar uh, non ischemic cardiomyopathies. And if you do some screening in cardiology clinics, um, this is data from uh, LA and New York City that if you have a patient that um, is born in Latin America and has a low ejection fraction, very significant chance that they have Chagas disease, um, similar to if they have any type of bundle branch block or if they have a pacemaker. So there is a, there is a known high prevalence in these populations. Um, the, the gastrointestinal involvement happens less often, and it's due to progressive destruction of the neurons of the enteric nervous system related to the parasite. Um, it is much, much less common than cardiac involvement, but typically presents as it most commonly affects the esophagus and causes achalasia and eventually progressing to mega esophagus. Uh, but it can also affect the colon, in particular the sigmoid colon and the rectum. Um, the, um, the, the GI involvement occurs almost exclusively in patients who are from particular, the southern uh, part of South America. So we very, very rarely see this in Central America or Mexico. And then the last important manifestation to mention at a transplant center is that Chagas disease um, can reactivate in immunocompromised patients, um, particularly um, post-transplant or patients with HIV AIDS. So this is a picture of um, Chagas um, meningoencephalitis, um, which is actually more common than toxoplasmosis in areas where it's endemic. Um, and this is a particular form of reactivation that we often see in um, patients who've received a solid organ transplant um, with paniculitis. 
Um, Chagas is something that is really Really, really important to recognize before cardiac transplantation um, because the reactivation is extremely frequent and it presents with myocarditis which mimics rejection so you have to know what you're treating. Um, diagnostic testing for Chagas depends on the stage of infection. Almost all of the patients that we're going to be seeing here at our center will have chronic Chagas and the way that you diagnose chronic Chagas is by doing serologic testing. Um, the issue with the serologic testing um, is one actually of both sensitivity and specificity, but um, mainly uh, you need two positive serologies using different assays to make a diagnosis. Um, we only have access commercially to one type of serology. So even if you send a serology to more than one lab, it, they're doing the same test. So in order to make an actual confirmation, um, you have to send a, sec a second serologic test to the CDC where they will do a separate immunoblot to confirm the diagnosis. Um, we rarely see acute disease here or reactivation, but um, in order to test for this, we screen differently. So we do microscopy to look for the parasite on blood smears, which looks like this, this C-shape for Chagas, um, and we send, we send PCR to the CDC. Um, Antitrypanosomal treatment um, is very poorly tolerated and often prolonged in many patients. The first line therapy is benzonidazole, um, but you have to take it for 60 days and it often cause, causes quite significant GI intolerance. Um, there's a risk of very severe exfoliative dermatitis and then uh, later in the course, patients can sometimes develop um, peripheral neuropathy and cytopenias. Um, about anywhere from 10 to 20% of patients end up needing to discontinue therapy because of side effects and tolerability issues. Um, the second line therapy is nefertamox, which um, also has a significant side effect profile um, that is somewhat different, but it's a second line therapy that we use if benzonidazole um, is not tolerated. Um, both these drugs at this point are approved by the FDA. Nefertamox was actually only very recently approved, but they're only approved in children ages two through 12. So for adults and congenital cases, they're actually being used off-label. Um, not everybody benefits from um, antitrypanosomal treatment. Um, our natural inclination is someone has a parasite, we want to get rid of that parasite. Um, but the goal of parasitic treatment in this case is only to prevent development of future cardiac disease. Um, it has no effect whatsoever on the gastrointestinal disease progression to our knowledge, and it will not reverse what is already there. So um, looking at the U.S. Chagas guidelines in terms of who actually benefits from antiparasitics, the people we always treat are people in the acute phase and children that have chronic Chagas disease because we think we have high cure. Um, and when Chagas reactivation patients that are immunosuppressed, um, this is actually life-saving. So those patients always get benzonidazole. Um, it is generally recommended based on observational data to treat women of reproductive age because we think it prevents congenital transmission. And people that are young, young being age of less than 50, who have ended either indeterminate or sometimes early cardiac disease, um, because um, there's some data showing that it decreases the risk of progression, uh, progression to, um, to severe cardiomyopathy. The people that are sometimes considered on a case-by-case -case basis, though guidelines differ, are people older than age 50 with indeterminate phase disease, and people that have GI disease with no cardiac involvement because you can potentially uh, protect the heart. Um, we do not give it to people that have advanced cardiac or GI disease uh, who are actively pregnant or who have advanced organ dysfunction. So um, antiparasitics most benefit people that are young and who have no cardiac or gastrointestinal involvement. Um, I'll briefly men uh, mention the benefit trial. Um, this is um, one of the best studies that we have um, in relation to Chagas disease. It's one of the few randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, but this evaluated people that had established cardiac involvement. Um, the median age in the study was 55, so fairly old relative to some of the population that we diagnose. Um, and in this study, um, Giving benzonidazole resulted in higher conversion to a negative PCR, but had no difference whatsoever um, on the risk of death or progressive cardiac disease, which occurred in about a third of patients regardless. These were patients that actually mainly had um, not particularly severe cardiac involvement, so NYHA class one or two. So our first patient, uh, the 26 to 28 year old who presented with stroke and apical dyskinesis, did get benzonidazole for two months. Uh, we had a tough conversation about whether to treat him, but we ultimately did, um, even though we had cardiac involvement just because he was so young. Um, we waited for quite a while to treat him because he had quite severe persistent expressive aphasia. And to this day, despite rehab, he only talks in one or two word um, sentences. Um, he ended up getting an implantable loop recorder 
um, and um, was found to have atrial fibrillation, so was required anticoagulation and then needed an AICD and pacemaker. Um, he, um, despite the fact that he is, um, he's overall doing reasonably, but uh, he can no longer work. He used to work in construction and this all actually happened at the time that he had a, his wife was pregnant. So he has a newborn and still requires, he's able to function independently, but requires a lot of help. Our second patient with uh, achalasia um, got an esophageal dilatation and actually is asymptomatic right now and is off TPN. He had a completely normal cardiac evaluation and is getting yearly EKGs and gastroenterology follow-up. We did not give him benzonidazole because the benefit was unclear. He wasn't confident that he could follow up every two weeks to make sure that he wasn't having toxicity related to it. And he has a manual job, so we were concerned about the risk of peripheral neuropathy. So in conclusion, um, for the Chagas portion of my talk, um, we, we need to reframe who we're screening for Chagas disease because we know that there's a significant prevalence in the DC metro area, depending on where you're originally, where people were uh, originally from. And our priority patients for screening are actually people who are asymptomatic and young because that's where antiparasitic treatment is most effective. Uh, women of reproductive age because we prevent congenital transmission and pregnant women so that we can monitor the newborn and then treat people eventually postpartum um, to prevent future infections. Um, even though we want to pick up people with existing cardiac disease, um, at this point it's too late to give them antiparasitics, but we can at least monitor for progression. Um, with existing gastro, uh, gastrointestinal disease, we can give antiparasitics to protect the heart. Um, and for organ donors and um, recipients, it's very important for, for monitoring and potential treatment. Um, and uh, the one other point worth mentioning is that every time we pick up a case, that's also an opportunity to screen family members who may have very similar exposures and, at, are, and are at high risk. Right. I'll move on to the next portion of my talk, um, which is part two, where have you lived? So this was a case of a 64 year old man who was itchy for five years and then eventually presented to our clinic with this migratory rash that we could actually see evolving in front of our eyes. So you can see it, it's very wormy looking. Um, he had eosinophilia and was actually originally from Southern Italy and had immigrated in the 1960s. And he really liked to garden often with bare hands and fresh manure. Um, this patient is a 56 year old woman who was seen at Georgetown. Um, she has a uh, very different patient. She is a patient who received a multivisceral transplant that had some very significant complications, including CMV ileitis, but then presented with weight loss, abdominal pain, and fever. Um, she herself was from the DC metro area, uh, but her, um, her donor had lived in both Florida and Guatemala. Her CT scan showed some dilated small bowel loops, and she received an endoscopy that showed significant duodenal inflammation, nodularity, and friable mucosa. And the biopsy results, results showed a surprise. You can see these little worm-like figures. And then on her stool open parasite uh, exam on microscopy, you can see that there are evidence of larvae present. Um, both these patients have different forms of strongyloides stercorellis. Uh, strongyloides is another soil transmitted helminth. Um, it's a nematode, otherwise known as a round worm, um, that is very prevalent throughout the tropics and subtropics, um, highest in the Caribbean, uh, Southeast Asia, and West and East Africa. Um, the prevalence studies really vary depending on what population you, of what migrant population you look at in the United States. But outside the tropics, we see quite a high prevalence in migrants from certain endemic countries. Um, there's a little bit in Southern Europe, and we also do see it as an endemic infection in parts of the United States. So um, first addressing some of the foreign born populations in the US. Um, Data in the Latin American uh, born population shows anywhere from a five to 10% prevalence, um, including a study in Washington, DC that showed about a 5% prevalence in patients who were Latin American you know, origin. And in the United States, it is known to be endemic at low level in um, various regions, including central Appalachia, so over here, which includes um, some parts of Virginia actually. Um, and I mentioned the study earlier in rural Alabama showing a 7% prevalence by um, qPCR. Um, the main risk factors are being rural, having low income, walking barefoot, having contact with human waste or sewage, and then occupations like farming or coal mining where people might have a lot of contact with soil. Um, the important thing to recognize about strongyloides is that strongyloides is for life unless you are treated, and it has to do with the life cycle. So the way that you get it is that the larvae penetrate directly through intact skins. That's why people get it by walking barefoot or by uh, involvement in agriculture. It has a phase where the larvae migrate via the lungs. It grows up to be an adult in the small bowel. Um, but then after that, it um, 
the adult makes eggs, the eggs then hatch into larvae, but that, those larvae are actually still infectious. So they can reinfect you by penetrating the skin around the anal area. So this is called auto-infection, meaning that it can complete its full cycle within the human host. So unless you treat it, it will just keep doing that and you will have it forever. Um, my personal record is treating it or diagnosing it 38 years after the patient left the endemic area. Strongyloides takes many different forms, the most common actually being asymptomatic, um, and this is what most chronic infection does. Some patients have intermittent eosinophilia, but a quarter will have no a normal eosinophil count, so you can't rule it out on that basis. Um, this is actually quite benign unless you give the person immune suppression. There's also the simple gastrointestinal form where people may present with weight loss, abdominal discomfort. Um, a classic finding is um, dyspepsia that's not responsive to PPIs. So if you have a patient that's been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome or dyspepsia who's from a strongyloides endemic country, this is something to consider because sometimes you test them and can cure it that way. And then there are also skin manifestations. So um, this patient, my the patient I showed you before has something called larva currens, which means uh, running larvae. And that presents as a rapidly migrating serpiginous lesion. Um, sometimes people just have unexplained pruritus. So before this, um, before this larva showed up there, he, he just had itching for five years that so was unexplained. Um, the question I always ask our fellows is how many ova and parasite tests does it take to de detect strongyloides in chronic infection? So patients with chronic infection, in order to get any sort of decent sensitivity, you need seven ova and parasite tests. And I don't know too many people that want to submit seven poop samples um, to our lab. Um, so the way that we screen for chronic infection is by doing serology and in some cases with supportive stool ova and parasite testing. Serology has a very, very high um, detection rate in patients that are immune competent. The exception to this is hyperinfection syndrome, which is our second patient that I will tell you about, where the larvae are very easily found in stool and sputum. So the big problem with strongyloides is not the chronic asymptomatic infection, it's hyperinfection and dissemination. Um, we see this specifically when someone with chronic strongyloides is given immune suppression, and it tends to be prolonged courses of high-dose steroids, and sometimes with HTLV, not HIV, co-infection. And what happens is because of that auto-infection cycle, you get this rapid accelerated increase in worm burden, and which ends up causing typically gastrointestinal and pulmonary symptoms because that's where the larvae are migrating. Um, when you get dissemination, the larvae leave the gut and go to other places, but they carry with them gram-negative um, and um, enteric bacteria. So people present often with um, polymicrobial gram-negative sepsis. And it can also, it can disseminate to any organ, but that also includes gram-negative meningitis. Um, this condition has a 50% mortality, um, even if treated appropriately. And sometimes people can also get rashes. So larvae have migrated to the skin and have caused this sort of reticulated purpuric lesion. If you biopsy it, you get a worm. Um, the story that we hear with hyperinfection is almost always the same. It's a patient who was originally from a tropical or subtropical region with strongyloides, typically who gets high dose steroids for some type of autoimmune or malignant condition, and then shows up with GI and respiratory symptoms and rash. And if it's not treated, it progresses to shock, sepsis, hypoxia, and gram negative bacteremia. Um, so if you hear a story like this, and actually this is the most important thing to point out, these patients do not have eosinophilia because they are usually on high dose steroids. So if you hear this story, you treat them first and then you test. Um, this is what the larvae actually look like. They're microscopic, so you can't see them with the naked eye and you see them typically in stool and in sputum. Um, and even though we almost never talk about this in subspecialty clinics or in internal medicine, um, the CDC has very clear guidelines about this, that we need to be thinking about it um, when patients begin corticosteroid therapy or immune suppression if they have risk factors. Um, the one setting that we are um, more systematic about checking for it is in the pre-transplant population. Um, but the message is really um, patients should be screened or treated before they're immune suppressed. Um, most centers do targeted screening based on risk factors, so typically looking at birth or long-term residence in an endemic area, um, and not to forget about military service. But there are a lot of unanswered questions about what's appropriate. So what do we consider an endemic area? Um, what qualifies as long-term residence? Some guidelines say three months, some say six months, and um, more recently, um, some data showing that targeted screening is still missing patients. Um, so this was, I'll mention one study that recently came out of a Houston transplant center. Um, they had a quite a serious infection with um, dissemin disseminated strongyloides that led them to re-examine their transplant screen uh, screening protocols. 
So instead of doing targeted screening, they did universal screening for 1,700 patients. Um, they found about 10% seropositivity. Um, and though they did identify some major risk factors, um, about 11% of patients um, had no particular standard risk factor for strongyloides. So strongyloides treatment is actually, um, for simple intestinal infection, it's quite easy. You need two doses of ivermectin. For disseminated disease, it's oral um, ivermectin and albendazole. And actually, if you can get it, there's a subcutaneous form um, that's used in veterinary medicine, but that is, that is more effective. And then antibiotics for gram-negative sepsis. Um, ivermectin is safe, um, cheap, and, um, and very easily administered. So our first patient who was itchy for five years got two doses of ivermectin. His itch went away, uh, the eosinophilia resolved, and he sero-reverted. Patient two with hyperinfection got ivermectin until um, she was better. Um, the patient herself was actually seronegative, so never mounted an immune response, but this was reported to the organ procurement organization and the donor tested seropositive. So then that allowed them to um, tell the other recipients and treat the other recipients. And this was, I'm trying not to mention COVID-19, um, but this, this was an op-ed that was recently published reminding people that many patients with COVID-19 have risk factors for strongyloides, that the equivalent of dexamethasone 6 or prednisone 40 um, is, a, is a relatively high dose of steroids. Um, it usually takes longer, but 10 days is enough to trigger hyperinfection syndrome. So the recommendation is that if you're invoking the recovery trial and the patient has strongyloides risk, risk factors, it's a good idea to give empiric ivermectin. We'll move on to part three, um, where have you traveled? So um, one of the things I've realized over the years is that we are actually, we're very good at asking about travel history, even more so in the past decade, but everything really revolves around outbreaks. So we're good at asking about that. So back in 2013, when the other coronavirus, MERS, was a, was a problem, we were very good at asking whether people had been to the Arabian Peninsula within 14 days. Similarly, in 2014, 2015, we were very good at asking um, whether anyone had been to West Africa in tw for, for 21 days because of Ebola. In 2016, 2017, we were great at asking about exposures to regions with Zika virus. And then, of course, pre-2020s, anybody that has seen my re ill return traveler talks, this was the differential diagnosis for everyone. And now it's, we are unfortunately in the midst of a, a pandemic where um, we are mostly focused on leaving your house and in travel throughout the United States as opposed to globally. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that um, this, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic now, there will continue to be outbreaks. And we also have to think about asking about travel, thinking it and asking about it, not just in relation to the immediate outbreak. So in terms of how to ask, so the first is of course thinking about it and asking about it. Um, so this was a patient I saw that had a progressive painless ulcer that had three biopsies uh, with no diagnosis. Um, this was another patient who, um, this was actually a weekend curbside phone call. Uh, they, they just wanted to know, does, uh, does we had a skin biopsy that grew citrobacter and will Cipro treat that? Um, neither one of these patients had volunteered that they'd traveled anywhere, but on more specific questioning, Patient one, about four months prior, had been to Malta, and this patient had attended an adult drumming camp in the forests of Panama about three weeks before. Um, neither one of them had thought to mention that because they thought that the um, infection had occurred, occurred while in North America after a bug bite here. Um, and both these patients actually have cutaneous leishmaniasis of different forms. Um, cutaneous leishmaniasis is a protozoan parasite. Um, the vector is this tiny little sand fly. You can see how small it is. This is a finger. Um, it's a painless bite that typically happens at night and people get ulcers that are progressive on exposed areas of their body. Um, and the reason you have to ask directly about travel is that these lesions can present weeks to months after the fact. And so patients will not volunteer it because they don't necessarily connect it with their trip. So important, thing, important point number one, think and ask about travel. I also can't look at an ulcer and say that it's not, it is or is not leishmaniasis because um, these are all cases of leishmaniasis. So it has many, many different possible morphologies. It's something that's particularly difficult to diagnose unless you send very specific testing. So the next point about taking a travel history is to be very specific about the time frame that you're asking about. This was a case of a woman at Georgetown who initially presented to the emergency department with six days of subjective fevers, chills, myalgias. Um, she vomited. Um, she did not have a fever at triage. And uh, they did do a, a triage Ebola screen. So she had not been to West Africa for 21 days and was discharged with a viral illness. 
um, ER visit too, a few days later. Now she comes with fever, vomiting, abdominal pain, and an objective temperature. Um, she has some interesting abnormalities, low platelets and a very mildly elevated liver enzyme. Um, but um, her CT abdomen pelvis was normal. That was because of the GI symptoms. And the report says that she had no history of recent travel. Um, she was discharged again with a viral illness. A few days later, she comes back with fever, headaches, vomiting, a temperature, and her mother is concerned about vivax malaria, which is exactly what she had. So she had plasmodium vivax malaria that at that point was severe and had a 5% parasitemia. Um, she ultimately did well. But she wasn't lying. She didn't have a history of recent travel. It depends on what you mean by recent. Um, she had spent um, several months in India um, and had come back seven months prior. So um, one aspect of malaria, um, Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale, which are two species of malaria, have a separate liver phase. So when, when you're bitten by the mosquito, the parasite initially goes to the liver, has to progress through the liver, and then enters the bloodstream. And this is the phase that makes you symptomatic with fevers. Um, vivax and ovale have a separate dormant liver phase that can have a delay of weeks to months before it reactivated. So that's what happened with her case. Um, for acute illness, I think you have to go back at least a year. So the question that I ask people is, have you left the United States in the past year? Um, and the reason for this is in particular vivax malaria. So falciparum malaria, the more common and deadly kind that people more, more commonly get in Africa, 96% of it will present within 30 days of illness, whereas vivax only uh, within 30 days of return from, um, from the trip, whereas with vivax only 60% will present within 30 days. Um, within 90 days, you've caught almost all the cases of P. falciparum, but only three quarters of the cases of Vivax. So about 20% of the cases of Vivax will show up somewhere between three months to a year after the person's return. So you have to go back a little bit further. So be specific about the time frame. Have you left the United States in the past, in the past year, in the past five years? Um, and sometimes in your lifetime, and we, there are certain situations where we really need to know about the person's uh, more long-term travel exposure. So this was a man I saw in clinic who was in his 40s and um, had had eosinophilia noted on a routine CBC in primary care clinic. He'd seen a number of different specialists and was diagnosed with seasonal allergies with no further workup. Um, he was born in Europe and had mainly been in the United States for the past six years, but about six to ten years ago he had actually been doing field research in Central Africa. Um, so this is the one that if you are, if you don't like worms um, and are eating your lunch, you might want to turn away for just a minute. Um, so about a year after he was initially noted to have eosinophilia, um, he declared himself and was referred to my clinic. So this is how he presented. And you can see that there is a migratory worm that is going across his eye. Um, this is loa loa, uh, which is a filarial infection that is acquired in Central Africa that, um, that manifests as, as a, a migratory worm, typically across the eye and sometimes um, swellings of the extremities. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to show that again. So um, lifetime exposure is important. Um, next travel tip is that some people think that when you ask about travel, you just mean vacation. Um, so that's part of the reason I also ask, have you ever lived in another country? Where were you born? If they say somewhere outside the United States, then when was the last time that you visited there? Because again, sometimes people don't think that visiting friends and relatives or going home um, is considered to be travel. And then the last important one to ask your patients is, did you ever serve in the military? Um, this is a man in his 50s that had a uh, liver lesion about 10 years prior. He had a biopsy that was non-diagnostic, but had a very odd allergic reaction after the biopsy. Um, 10 years later, then developed um, worsening abdominal pain, elevated liver enzymes, ended up getting an ultrasound that shows this um, septated cystic lesion with this unusual exophytic growth. This then prompted an MRI, which again, you can see this septated uh, lesion that was um, on MRI was partially enhancing. Um, if you ask him if he traveled, he'd been to the Greek Isles um, for a few weeks in the 1980s. But uh, when asked about military service, he had actually spent um, two years in rural Turkey, um, which is a prime location for cystic echinococcus, um, so which causes liver and pulmonary cysts. Um, this diagnosis was actually made by a very astute um, hepatobiliary surgeon who, um, who thought the lesion looked unusual and thought to ask um, about, about his past exposures. Um, cystic echinococcus, uh, it typically it's, uh, it's caused by echinococcus granulosis, um, which is um, a tapeworm and it most commonly causes cysts in the liver that can be multi-septated, but they have, a, they have a variety of potential different appearances. 
um, the important aspect of it. So it's the cysts are surrounded by a layer of host tissue, but on the inside contain extremely um, infectious material, these protoscolices and, as well as hooklets. So if you biopsy this and any of these protoscolices get out, you effectively can create um, metastatic echinococcal cysts where it can get into the peritoneum and can be very, very difficult to get rid of. So these are not, if you see one of these, um, you actually don't want to biopsy this um, if at all possible, particularly not under uncontrolled conditions. So in my last trip, a tip about the travel history is to ask people three ways. So usually you've done that if you've done numbers one and two, but sometimes I will specifically ask them if they've been to continent X, Y, Z. Um, and then as a last question, and what other countries have you been to? It helps people jog their memory. So um, there are many, many barriers to diagnosing and treating uh, neglected diseases in the United States, ranging from stigma, poverty, um, diagnostic availability, um, lack of health access, and um, but provider awareness, the first step is knowing where your patients were born, have lived, and have traveled. So you know when you need to consider something that is common in other places, um, but maybe not in, in patients who were born in the United States. Um, and also important, um, these neglected diseases are not zebras. Um, they are there if you look. Um, and we've actually been diagnosing a lot of Chagas disease and strongyloides lately um, in the DMV, reflective of our epidemiology. Um, diseases of poverty also travel in packs. So if you have Chagas, there's about a 15% chance you have strongyloides. If you have strongyloides, um, about half of those patients have some other type of infectious disease. And um, data from an HIV clinic in Atlanta found that their patients who were HIV positive and foreign born had very high prevalences of other neglected tropical diseases. So if you ask, if you find out that your patient is born in Mexico, Central or South America, think about Chagas disease and you actually want to screen people when they're young and healthy, not when they have cardiovascular or gastrointestinal symptoms. So you don't want to wait for that because when they're younger, you have a chance of treating them and preventing progression. Um, cost is sometimes an issue. There is There are free screening programs in Washington, D.C. through the Latin American Society of Chagas. So if anybody has questions about that or the program, I, I can give them contacts anytime. Um, if the answer to the question, where have you lived, is somewhere in a tropical or subtropical region and or the rural or southeast of the United States, think about strongyloides, um, active infection if the person has GI symptoms, paritis, rash, or eosinophilia. And, um, but if you're going to immunosuppress someone like this, um, you need to test and treat or treat them before you start steroids. And um, when you're taking a travel history, it's important to be specific. Uh, make sure you ask not just about vacation, and I usually say ask three ways. Um, also recognizing that some neglected tropical diseases um, can present years to decades after the person was originally infected. So with that, um, I'll say thank you and take questions. Um, I want to specifically thank uh, my Georgetown infectious disease physician who, um, as Dr. Kumar says, puts up with my patients bringing all sorts of interesting samples to the clinic, um, our nurses, our staff, and then um, very specifically to our phlebotomist, Barron, and the Georgetown lab supervisor, Patrick Noto. Um, with, with those latter two individuals, I could not run my clinic without their help um, because they arranged for all of my parasite tests to be sent to, um, to the CDC.